Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here with us this evening in celebration of Black History Month. This event is being hosted by the Black Mental Health Graduate Academy uh, in the Center for Multicultural and Global Mental Health at William James College. I'm Dr. Natalie Court, the co-director of the center and the director of the Black Mental Health Graduate Academy. We are so honored and delighted to be able to bring you this fireside chat tonight with the iconic Dr. Shani Dowd. This, this fireside chat this evening is gonna be moderated by one of our student leaders, Tia Rivera, who is also a lead mentor in the Black Mental Health Graduate Academy. I wanted to just share with you that <laughs> the Academy uh, is a unique program that we started in 2016 with Dr. Dowd's championship and advocacy. And we're really quite grateful for her, uh, for the influence that uh, she brought to bear. The Academy is a leadership and mentorship program that's designed to recruit and mentor talented Black individuals who are committed to becoming leaders and agents of social change in the fields of psychology and mental health counseling. Our scholars in the academy have since 2016 assumed a number of leadership roles and positions at national professional organizations as well as at WJC. They've also been directors of student groups focused on multicultural issues and social justice. Furthermore, our scholars have been awardees of prestigious merit scholarships in recognition of their abiding commitment to working with underserved communities. And so for Black History Month, I'm, I'm really excited about just celebrating our scholars in the Black Mental Health Graduate Academy, as well as our students in the African and Caribbean Mental Health Program who are dedicated to developing the necessary clinical and assessment skills to work with individuals from Black communities. So again, we are delighted to have you here today in celebration of Black History Month. Um, this is a celebration that was developed in 1915 by Dr. Carter Goodson, Woodson, sorry. Um, and it started off um, as National Negro History Week in 1926 and then was identified as an officially recognized holiday, um, sorry, recognized month um, in 1976 by President Gerald Ford. And when he did that, he called upon the public to seize the opportunity to honor the too often neglected accomplishment of black Americans in every area of endeavor throughout our history. And tonight we have an iconic black American who is going to share her wisdom and her thoughts with us. Um, before we do that, uh, I wanna just share a little bit about our moderator, Tia Rivera, who is a third year doctoral student at William James College. Tia is um, developing a level of specialization in um, children and families who have experienced adversity um, and resilience. She's also concentrating in African and Caribbean mental health. Tia has a bachelor's degree in psychology and a minor in women and gender study from Rutgers University. She's also a recipient of our prestigious Star Fellowship, and we're really delighted um, by her excellence. Um, and Tia is incredibly passionate about working with black and brown uh, children and adolescents. So we thank you, Tia, for, for serving as our moderator today. The questions that are gonna be asked to Dr. Dowd were put together and developed by members of the Black Mental Health Graduate Academy. So to all scholars, we are grateful for your thoughtful questions. So. We're grateful this evening. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Dowd, for being here, giving us your time and sharing your wisdom. Thank you for having me. 
it's a great honor to be invited to do something like this and to be called iconic. Wow. That's what you are. <laughs> T, I'll turn it over to you. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Um, so I'm just going to uh, share with you um, some information about Dr. Dowd and just her amazingness overall. Um, so Dr. Dowd, um, LWJC Board of Trustees member, is a licensed social worker um, who previously served as Director of Culture Insight and Operating Program of the Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare Foundation. In celebration of Black History Month, we appreciate you joining us for a candid conversation, um, conversation with Dr. Dowd about representation, identity, uh, diversity, in the, and diversity in the Black family. Um, Dr. Dowd is an expert in culturally informed healthcare systems, health disparities, and needs of communities of color and LGBTQ communities. She's an assistant clinical professor of psychiatry at the Boston University School of Medicine. And additionally, for the past 40 years, Dr. Dowd has also been an instructor and supervisor with um, Center for Multicultural Training in Psychology. Um, CMTP is the American Psychologist Association's um, oldest um, pre-doctoral internship program, specifically focused on training psychologists to work with underserved populations, um, underserved populations including racial uh, and ethnic minorities. Dr. Dowd is the 2017 recipient of the Massachusetts Public Health Association's Emil Shattuck Award, I hope I said that right, um, for contr uh, contributions to the field of public health. So if we could all like unmute and maybe just give her like a little applause and snaps if you'd like, just for everything she's accomplished. Like it's so awesome. So we're so honored to have you here tonight. Thank you, thank you. It's Lemuel Shattuck. And by the way, uh, Lemuel Shattuck was the man who's cons widely considered the father of American public health. He was the first person to begin to put together a public health system for the US. That's awesome. I didn't know that. So thank you for sharing that with me and I everyone else. I here until they called me up and I had to go look it up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So if we're ready, um, I can share the first question. So America's systemic and traumatic racial discrimination has had profoundly negative physical and psychological effects on the health of black families. Um, we've observed the enduring effects of discrimination in our healthcare system um, in the disproportionately high rates of severe COVID in um, black communities. Um, how do Black families overcome these racially um, driven intergenerational traumas and health challenges? They don't. Mm -hmm. You know, I looked at that question and I thought Black people are 13%, I think it's that 12% of the American population. And we continually run up against this mythology that we are supposed to dismantle racism overcome the barriers and win at all odds against another 200 million people who are quite content to have us stay in our place, which is at the bottom. So I think that's unfair. And I think we have to flip that script and acknowledge that we're really up against a hugely created system that at every turn has created these legal, moral, ethical barriers to our success. And the surprise to me is not that so many of our families are struggling. The surprise to me is that we're standing at all because we have been through so much as a people. We continue to go through so much as a people. And yet, despite all of that, we continue to rise. Why is that? How does that happen? Because we keep looking at the people who are failing, the people who are um, succumbing to these pressures, who are not able to leap, leap tall buildings on a single bound. But we don't ever ask the question, how is it that 75% of black families only 50 years after freedom are doing as well as we're doing? because we've only been free for 50 years. I grew up in Jim Crow South. 
and I can tell you straight up that it was no picnic. Mm -hmm. So that that mythology that, oh, well, slavery ended a long time ago. Why are we still talking about it? Well, my grandfather, my grandfather was born 10 years after the emancipation. So to me, it's not that far in my rear view mirror. This is within living history. I can almost reach out and touch it. And I grew up with all of the markers of slavery all around me. Slave cabins tumbling down in the woods, plantations, um, the Confederate flag everywhere. I mean, we've only been free for 50 years. How is it that so many of us have been able to pull ourselves up by non-existent bootstraps? So I just want to, you know, kind of flip that script a little bit. One of the things that I was thinking about is the research. We have almost no research on black middle-class families. We have almost no research on black working class families. We have a lot of research. Most of our research is on the poorest of our families. Mm -hmm. Now, how is, how is that, why is that? And how is it that nobody seems to notice that? That when you think about it, most academic training centers are located in black and brown communities in the inner cities all across the country, in Los Angeles and Detroit, in Baltimore, Boston, all of these academic training centers are in poor communities. And all of these academic training centers research the heck out of the people that they can reach who do not have the agency to push back and say, no, nothing, no research without us. They don't have that agency. They're not going out to research the links for those of you who don't know, the Lynx is an organization predominantly of black middle-class families that's uh, quite old, it's been around for a long time, but I've never seen a paper on the Lynx, ever. Now, isn't that interesting? So we get this picture of the black family that is profoundly negatively tilted, that is given to us as this is the picture. No, it's not. It's a slice of the picture and it's an important slice of the picture because these are the people that we have to lift up and we have to figure out what is it that they need to survive and thrive also, not just survive, but survive and thrive. But this, this tilt that we keep kind of embedding in our research and our teaching and the way we look at black families. When we look at black families, nobody's, researching a family like mine or like yours, they're finding the poorest of our families. And those are the ones that they write about and they don't, the title of the article is not a depression in poor black families. It's depression in black families. So this kind of bait and switch is something that I think as scholars, we need to be extremely critical of. We need to call this out. This is systemic racism in action and it's on our watch. And we have to call that out and keep calling it out. And the interesting thing is there is some research being done on a much smaller scale. And you know where it shows up? In doctoral dissertations and doc projects. It's the students who are reaching back and researching. And when you go through those projects, oh my God, you find all this different research that never shows up in the journals. And it doesn't show up in the journals, not because the students aren't interested in publishing, but because the journals aren't interested in that research. Mm. So I say, first of all, let's stop expecting the black families to dismantle what we saw on January 6th. We didn't cause that. That's not ours. That's not our problem to solve or fix. But we have to stop allowing that kind of rhetoric to play out around us as if it's truth. It's not truth. It's a slice of the truth. But we wanna pull the camera back and take a look at that bigger picture. How is it that 
being two generations, three generations post-slavery? How is it that so many of our families are doing as well as they are? What is it that black people bring to the table? What is it that we brought out of slavery days that we've used to sustain us? What is it that we use now within the boundaries of our families to sustain us? Because if we can learn more about that, we'll know more about how to help those who are not being sustained. What is it that my parents know and built that their parents don't know about? I, you know, I, I get wound up on these subjects. So I'm just going <laughs> to shut up for a minute. <laughs> no, I, I could listen to you speak all day, honestly, um, especially like, you know, what you're talking about. Um, it kind of relates to my doc project. I know some people in the room with their doc projects too. Like it, it speaks a lot to what we're, we're studying and you bring up already the good point of it's in people's dissertations that you're finding this important information that's not really out there that should be out there already. Yeah. So you bring up a lot of valid points. So I appreciate, I love your answer. <laughs> um, so I'll progress to the next question. So um, police brutality. Can I just make one more comment? Of course. <laughs> Once again, storm the citadels of APA. Because when I was a graduate student, the journals accepted all kinds of different literature for publication, including qualitative studies, theoretical studies, quantitative studies, retrospective studies. And then at some point, long about the 80s, they decided, oh, that's bad research. We only want quantitative studies. And that sliced out a whole lot of conversations. You cannot look in the literature now, in 2021, you cannot look in the literature and find articles that help you deal with an aggressive Black patient in a clinical setting. They're not there. So the literature is of no help in helping us help our, our families. So I think it's time for us as professionals to start storming the APA again and saying, this is unfair. This is an example of systemic racism in action. And we demand that these journals start to look different, seek out different knowledge bases, seek out different information and publish it. So I just, <laughs> I'm down to join that revolution along with you. I'm sure a lot of people are down to join it with you. So I see a lot of hands are up for it. So whenever that starts up, hit us up. We'll be right there. <laughs> um, so following the, the next question. So police brutality directed towards black children, men and women has persisted for decades after, you know, decades. Um, what advice do you have for Black parents and families to help them have like the talk with their children? And a uh, second question to that is how do we strengthen them in the face of racial bias? That's a, that's a challenging one because I know when my son was young, he didn't want to hear that talk. Mm -hmm. He would straight up say to me, oh, that's old timey stuff. It's different now. And because he was too young, he wasn't yet old enough to come under the gaze of the police. And until he was old enough, he didn't understand why I was so intent on talking to him about these things. And he just rejected it. But I kept sitting him down when sometimes we would use television programs, we'd be watching a show and it would come up in the show and I would talk to him about it, um, ask him about it, but he wanted no parts of the conversation until he was 16 and a policeman threw him up against the wall and took the leather jacket that I had given him for Christmas. After searching him, rummaging through his clothing, through his underwear, determined to find the drugs that he must have on him because he was a black boy with a black leather jacket. And this was back when all the young boys had black leather jackets. It was their manhood thing. And the officer actually had the nerve to tell him, well, if your mama gave you this jacket, you tell her to come down to the police station and she can get it. He 
He came home that night distraught, just broken up. And my heart broke. But I knew I couldn't protect him from that officer. I could prepare him. But that was the night that he began to understand what I had been trying to tell him. So for parents, it's kind of like sex education, very similar, that you have to start talking to them before they're ready to hear it. And they will reject it. They will tell you that, oh, I know all that. I don't need to hear that. But you need to have those conversations. And they're awkward and uncomfortable. But you, you can't wait. If I had waited until that night to have that conversation with him, it would have been way too late. So the fact that I was having the conversation with him, now he understood it. Now he got what it was about. But it's a hard, hard thing. It's how do you sit down and tell your child, you are bait out there for these people in blue with a shield and a badge and a gun to do whatever they want to you. And I, as your parent, cannot protect you. That's an awful thing to have to tell your child, that you cannot protect them. But it is the truth. It is the truth. I couldn't stop that cop from throwing my boy up against the wall. But what I could do is march down to that police station the next day with that receipt from when I bought that jacket and raise holy hell. Mm -hmm. I, I man fired. I did not succeed, but I cost him three days pay. He was suspended for three days. That was the best I could do. And I got the damn jacket back. And he was as nasty to me as he'd been to my son. But for us as parents, it's a scary thing to know that your child is out there and beyond a certain age, you can't keep them in the house their whole life. You have to let them walk down to the corner store, go meet their friends, play in basketball in the schoolyard after hours. So you can't be there all the time. And that, that is, I think, the hardest barrier for us as parents to sitting down and have that conversation is the recognition and acknowledgement that we really can't protect their children. When we sh our children shouldn't have to face this. He should never have been treated like he was treated. But I knew it was going to happen. So there is no good answer to this one because the situation that we're up against is illegal, immoral. It's prejudicial. It, there's, there's nothing right about this. And I think our best weapon is exactly what Black Lives Matter is doing is storming the Citadel saying, no, this has to stop. I'm so grateful to the cell phones that are now documenting these events as they happen and showing people that this, yes, this is real. We are not exaggerating, we're not making it up. The other thing we have to do is believe our children when they come home and tell us these stories. Don't tell them, shut up and sit down, draw it out of them. Praise them for however they got out of that situation, however they managed to make it home to my arms, because that's what's important to me. The worst thing that can happen to a young person is have these things happen, go home and have a parent say, well, I told you so. That's, that's demoralizing. That simply means that that child will never again tell you when this stuff happens. So you need to listen to them. You need to sit them down, draw them out. Don't overwhelm them with your own experience. Just listen to theirs. Ask them, have your friends had this happen to them? Is this the first time it's happened? Because they need to be validated that this is real, that this really happened. And I remember my son saying to me, well, he was just doing his job. He was trying to sort it out in his own mind. Why did he do what he did? And he needed to hear me say, no, he was not just doing his job. What he did to you was wrong and it shouldn't have happened. That's what they need to hear from us as parents. And how do we strengthen them in the face of racial bias? 
we love our children. The worst thing for any child, but particularly a black child, is to feel disconnected from the parents. You know, study after study shows that teenagers look to their parents first for information. That's their first source of information. Now, they may sit in front of you and roll their eyes and do all that, but they're going to come to you first. If we don't, from the time they're tiny, make them feel like we love them, no matter how outrageous they can be, that we cherish them, that we see them, we see their particular skills and talents and aptitudes, that we celebrate those, that that's the love is what will carry them through this. That's, it's like, I remember once um, some comedian, I don't remember who it was, said that love is like a bank. You just make deposits regularly because every once in a while, you're gonna have to make a deep withdrawal and if you don't have enough love in that bank, that withdrawal could break the bank. Most of the children who get in trouble with the law, who end up in our juvenile um, systems, are children who feel disconnected from their families and disconnected from their parents. They don't trust that their parents love them or care about them or see them. Um, not all, there are some children that just wander that way. You know, if they're growing up in a neighborhood where that's what you do, they can get swept up even, even with our best efforts. But the best inoculation you can give your child is a sense of love and a sense of connection every day, some little thing. That's, that's our inoculation. But this brutality is not accidental. It's not an accident. Police forces were designed as slave catching forces. That's how police originated. They would run around and snatch black people up. They still do. You know, I was out in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Now in Albuquerque, New Mexico, the black population is only about 4%. But isn't it interesting that their jails, their prisons in New Mexico are 85% black and Latino. Where'd they get all those black people from? There aren't that many black people in New Mexico. But if, when you look at those numbers, it makes it clear that pretty much any black person that walks across the walk in that state is liable to end up in prison. That's why we have to, we have to attack this on many, many levels, not just the family level. We have to attack it at the family level, at the individual level. We have to attack it at the institutional level and we have to be outrageous. We have to be outrageous. Because as, as you have seen in the last two years, when Colin Kaepernick took a knee, they shunned him. It cost him his career. They bedeviled that man, called him a traitor, a coward, every bad name you could throw because he took a knee. When we marched, oh, that, that was terrible. That was terrible. I remember when Black Lives Matter protests right here in Boston shut the um, Route 93 down. Oh my God, the, the heavens fell in because people were late for work. The unfortunate truth is, and as controversial as I'm gonna say it because I can't, they never pay attention to us till we start burning some shit down. Every 20 years or so, we have to burn some stuff down. And then they go, oh my God. Well, if you had been paying attention to what we were trying to tell you in our court testimony, in our papers, in our newspapers, in our personal testimonies, if you had been listening, we wouldn't have to do this, but you refuse to listen. So even now we're watching January 6th, a mob attacked the Capitol and killed five people. And they had officers out front taking selfies with the rioters. And just a few months before that, tear gas was sprayed on a group of peaceful black protesters to move them out of the way so the president could have a photo op. Right in front of our eyes, there it is, there it is. But we have to be courageous. 
I don't say we have to be brave because people are, I'm tired of people telling me I have to be brave. Bravery is one of those things where it's kind of a personality characteristic. You know, you're either brave or you're not. And no, throw that out. You have to be courageous because courageous means you can be shaking in your boots scared and do it anyway. Courage is when you know you are scared, you acknowledge the fear and you step and do it anyway. We have to continue to be courageous. We have to tell the stories of our family's ancestors and we all have them. We all have ancestors in our family who were courageous at a certain moment in time. And those stories get lost in time because they're so painful. But we have to unearth those stories and tell those stories because it reminds us that I can be courageous just like my grandfather was courageous. I can be courageous just like my Aunt Nora was courageous. And I don't have to not be scared to be courageous. And that gets transmitted to, my, to our children. My son is a very courageous man. I've watched him go up against barrier after barrier. And sometimes I sit back and I'm saying, damn, dude, I'm impressed. How'd you do that? Because he's showing that he understands the power of courage. So I say, don't be brave, but be courageous and be willing to have these conversations with your kids. Be willing to love your kids, not wrap them up in cotton wool, but love them and step out on courage every time, every time. The person I want to call out is the young woman who took George Floyd video. She was 17 years old and she stood on that curb and she videotaped that entire assault and murder. You can hear her voice. You can hear that's her voice saying, get up off him, get off him. 17 years old and she did not waver and she did not let that camera lose focus. She was courageous enough to stand. She's gotten a lot of death threats. It's been extraordinarily traumatic for her, but we should all raise her up and call her out. That was powerful and definitely, I'm sure a lot of people also feel just that hold of just being courageous. So I really appreciate that message that you're sending out, not only to us to be create courageous, but to also just with parents to talk about their kids about what's going on in society with people who look just like them, with people who look like us. So that's very powerful, thank you. Um, so on to the next one. Um, so in, in many black communities um, and churches, homophobia and transphobia are complicated and divisive issues. Um, why do many in our community struggle with, you know, acknowledging and celebrating our LGBTQ brothers and sisters? Um, and how do we bridge these divides and reduce these biases? First of all, we have to keep showing up. Um, I've mentioned I grew up under Jim Crow and in the black church in that era, because that was our sanctuary. It was always Sister Sarah and her special friend, Brother Thomas and his special friend, Nobody wanted to talk about it. They were always there. And everybody knew, everybody knew. And it was interesting, it was only when white evangelical ministers decided to raise homophobia to an art form that they influenced black ministers to do the same. I never heard, ever heard a black minister talk about the gays and the lesbians and the homosexuals in church until the seventies. It just wasn't done. It was not done. Now it's so ordinary that you don't think, you think it's always been that way. It was not always that way. It was not always that way. So that's important to keep in mind because there was a time when there was more tolerance. I won't say acceptance, but I will say there was more tolerance. 
And the majority culture is what influenced the black church to become so, so in league with that rabidly homophobic message. And one of the things I find, I'll say it, amusing, you see me, I'm a butch lesbian sitting right up here, proud as punch. I am who I am. And I'll walk up in any black church in this area. And you know what? I walk in like I own the place because I do. And what's interesting is I'm always treated with respect. But if I snuck in there, that would be really different. And I would get a very different reaction. And I say that to say that we have to push against this. We have to show up. What we've been doing so far is running away from it. You know, running away from the black community, all of the places where black lives are lived out, all of those institutions that support the black community, gay people tend to abandon them because who wants to be made uncomfortable in your own house? But at some point we have to claim our house. And one of the things I say when these people who um, are, think they are holier than anyone else roll up on me with that, well, God didn't mean for Adam and Steve. And I'm like, wait a minute, do you believe that your God is all knowing? Well, yes. Do you believe your God makes mistakes? No, God don't make no mistakes. Then. Why do you think God keeps creating queer, gender non-conforming, and gay people over and over and over again in every generation, in every culture, in every state, in every country? Why do you think that is? If God doesn't make any mistakes, I must be part of God's plan. And you know what, they, they start backing up. Well, well, I just know what I believe. I, no, I'm asking you a question. Do you believe your God makes mistakes? But you see, I'm old now. I'm no longer intimidated by all these people. I, I, there's a very well-known minister here in Boston that I'm acquainted with. He's not a friend by any means. And he keeps jumping up on this homophobic nonsense. And he got up on it around gay marriage before gay marriage was legalized. And he put an article in the paper and I wrote a letter to him, directly to him, person to person. And I said, so-and-so, I don't wanna name him because you'd probably recognize him. Maybe I should name him. I said, so-and-so, the next time I see you, we're gonna have a conversation. And here's what the conversation's gonna be like. And I laid it out for him. And at the end of the letter, I said, if you can't support me when I have supported so many of your projects and your agendas, if you cannot support me, do me the grace of getting the hell out of my way. He refused to answer the letter, which didn't surprise me. But I went after him the next time I saw him, I walked up, it was hilarious. You should see him backpedaling because <laughs> he saw me coming. He knew I was coming for him. I was coming for him. Like, no, you don't get to play both sides. You don't get to hit me up when you want a favor for your congregation, when you need some resources bought your way and then turn around and dog me out like that. No, you don't get to play that. So that's where courage comes in again. We have to stop being intimidated to speak up and speak out because they do try to intimidate us. You know, he gets up on his high horse and I'm like, I get up on mine. So. Part of, the, part of the reality of being gay and being trans is that there's a psychological process that goes on when people figure, try to figure out if they can be okay with something. And there's a point cognitively that people reach where they hit something, an image, a behavior, a thought, a belief that stirs up a disgust response in them. And where that line is, is different for everybody. But once they hit that line, it generates a powerful emotional and physical, physiological response in them that they have a hard time backing away from. They don't know how to manage that. So a, a friend of mine, my neighbor says all the time, 
She says, I don't understand what it is with people. Why do they keep trying to get a visual? I don't care what you're doing in the bedroom. And she's absolutely right. Because when people try to get a vis visual, they're going to make pictures in their own heads. They're making up the pictures, not me. And then they're going to get to a picture that they're going to go, ooh. And then they're going to attach that feeling to me. Even though I didn't do anything. And that's part of what makes it hard for people. And what helps is when they bump into gay people over and over. The lawyer's gay, the dentist's gay, the plumber's gay, the automobile mechanic is gay. And then they start to realize, oh, wait, um, they didn't do anything to me. I don't feel that ooh feeling. And that's why it's so important to be out if you can't afford to. And I say, if you can't afford to, because some people are in circumstances where it would be deadly for them to try to be out. And one of the problems for us now in the gay community is that because of the successes that we've had, children are coming out so young that they cannot defend themselves. Now, I knew I was gay at that same age, about 12, certainly by 13, I was real clear by then but I didn't come out until after college, after grad school, actually. By then I was an adult. I could stick up for myself. I could run when I need to. I could provide my own food and lodging, but a 12 year old can't do that. And so we really have to work to protect the children who are our successors. Um, I had a conversation with a friend who's uh, had a family member, a 14 year old, to come out family and say she was pretty sure she was gay. And my friend was saying, oh, she doesn't know what that means. And I went off on her. I said, that is so offensive. Nobody ever says a straight child doesn't know what that means when they start writing letters to an opposite sex partner. Ever, ever. I've never heard a parent say to a straight child, Oh, you don't know what that means. That's just a phase. That's reserved for our gay children. Do not do that to them. She knows what she's talking about. She may not be experienced yet, but she might be. <laughs> don't assume. But please do not sit back and say, oh, it's just a phase. She doesn't know what she's saying. Yes, yeah, she does. And she's looking to you to love her, which will not happen if you invalidate what she's just shared with you. But um, when I came out, I was a child and family therapist at a predominantly black and Latino agency in Boston, a community health center. And I thought seriously, this could be the end of my career. This was long about 1975. People weren't coming out of the closet in 1975. And I was really, I really thought this could be the end, but I wasn't gonna live in a closet anymore. And I'm a child therapist, right? I got people's babies up in my room. People started dragging their kids from every little nook and cranny into my office. Some of them were queer kids. Some of them were gender variant kids and some of them were just bad little kids. And I remember one mother came in dragging her little son and she said, well, He's not, he's not, you know, like you, but I figure if you're tough enough to be you, you're tough enough to handle him. <laughs> not only was it not the end of my career, my practice exploded. It literally just blew up. So we have to trust our people too, because for every person that is homophobic and violently homophobic, there are others who are standing and they're silent mostly because they literally don't know what to say. They don't know what to say. So part of what we can do is arm them with, here's what you can say. Don't get mad at them because they're silent. Understand why they're silent and arm them with some simple things that they can say. Because if they're complicated, they won't be able to do it in the midst of the anxiety. It can be simple. Just as simple as saying, you could look at them and smile and say, that's really offensive. <laughs> that gives them a way to step up and support us. Because I keep finding a lot of people want to be supported and don't know how, and don't know how. 
Um, did I answer that question? <laughs> Sounds about right to me. Thank you so much. <laughs> See a lot of clapping hands, so I'm sure that that the answers the answers met the questions. So thank you so much. Yes, we definitely have to put more support behind um, our LGBTQ community, especially for the Black LGBTQ community. Um, I think about a lot of the you know Black transgender women who have been killed at a astronomical rate in the past few years, and it, it's heartbreaking to see, and definitely something that needs to be talked about a lot more because it's not given enough attention. Um, so violence against Black and Latino trans women and the ability of Black and Latino trans men who are simply not seen at all. Yeah, it's, it's very hurtful, but I, I appreciate your answers so much. Um, so we're coming to our last question. So, um, so finally, um, one legacy of slavery that we continue to struggle with is colorism. So when biracial children of slave masters and enslaved women um, were favored with uh, less labor intensive tasks than other dark skinned enslaved people, um, colorism divides the black community and is a threat to self esteem and mental health for many um, young black children. So how do we dismantle this painful legacy in the black community? By talking about it by talking about it. I mean, you can look at me, I mean, come on. I've been, I've benefited from it and I've been harmed by it. There's no doubt in my mind that I would not have had the career I've had, had I been your tone. I was acceptable to white people because they felt more comfortable with me. I'm light skinned and I can speak standard English quite well. On the other hand, watching the damage it does to our sisters and brothers who are darker toned, who get looked over, passed over, seen as less than, less intelligent than. I know that as a very small child, adults would make over me. Like, oh, she's so pretty. She's got such good hair. And it felt sleazy. Oh, it, it was it was creepy to me. It was like, I didn't want him to touch me. And I'd be standing there in Sunday school, looking over at my friend who's brown skin, like, why don't they see that she's pretty? Why don't they see that she's pretty? And what allowed me to appreciate the power of this nonsense around colorism, but it's powerful, is that both of my parents talked about it my father in particular, and he would say, look, people are gonna make over you because you're light, but don't let it mean anything because it means nothing. It means they want you to be who they want you to be. We have to talk about it in our families. We have to talk about it in our communities. We have to talk about it in our workplaces. When we see light-skinned people being invited in for an interview and the brown-skinned brother or sister being seen as, well, not quite a good fit because it plays out there all the time in our educational system, when in classrooms, when the light-skinned student raises their hand and they get called on and the brown-skinned student raises their hand and they get ignored, we have to call that out. I remember getting in trouble in college because I would say, oh, professor, I think she had her hand up first. It did not make the professor happy, but that's with courage again, you have to speak on it. It's hard to say how we can make it disappear because it's celebrated all around us. Look at the fashion magazines. I'm appalled when I look at makeup commercials um, I was watching a, a YouTube video the other day where a young black woman was being made up and I watched them lighten her skin with the makeup. She was this gorgeous brown skinned sister and they were making her lighter through the makeup choices. And when you finished, she was almost unrecognizable. I'm like, this sucks. We have to start 
addressing it in our media. And there's been, there's been more focus for which I'm very grateful to see, particularly in movies and television, people really calling it out more often and people in powerful places. Denzel, thank you, my man, because he, he just names it. And he's a good looking brother. Hey, I'm gay, I'm not dead. <laughs> But we have to call it out and we have to keep calling it out. I loved when Obama made fun of it at one of the um, correspondence roasts because that's at the very top of the power hierarchy and he named it and called it out. That's what we have to do all the time over and over and over and over again. Because you see, there's so much money invested in this. There is money invested in who gets a, trained, who doesn't get trained. Who gets selected? Who doesn't get selected? Who gets promoted? Who doesn't? There's a lot of money in this. So it's not going to be easy to unpack this and to push it because we're always going to be pushing up against people who have a lot of money. And they don't have to come forward and say, I like my Black people light skin. They don't even have to say a word, but their money, what, they, what projects they promote, what, what um, things they support, what companies they support, speaks loudly. It's one of the things I love about Tyler Perry. Now I know educated black folks do not like Tyler Perry. I get it. But Tyler Perry speaks for a huge audience and he speaks to that audience in a way we don't. He speaks to that audience. And when he casts a movie, you see your range tone. You see a range of skin tones in his movies. So we want to call it out and we have to keep calling it out, naming it in the family, naming it in the neighborhood, naming it and resisting it. If my father and mother had not educated me at an early age and started talking to me before I even could figure out, I just knew it felt skeevy. I didn't really get what was going on, but they named it for me. They helped me put labels on it and they helped me be able to recognize it. But even so, not too long ago, just a couple of weeks ago, a close friend of mine actually said to me, well, you're light skinned, so you don't really have the black experience. Now what's hilarious is I'm the one that grew up under Jim Crow, not her. <laughs> I've had way more of the black experience than she ever saw. <laughs> but it's all about the skin tone and the perceptions that go along with it. So we have, I have to push against it all the time. I know people look at me different. Black people look at me a certain way. White people look at me a certain way just because of my skin tone. And I have to be willing to name it even when it disadvantages me, especially when naming it disadvantages me. I can't just coast around here and say, oh, well, it's not that much of a problem. It is a huge problem. And we know from all the research that by the time children are three, they've picked it up. They don't understand it, but they see it, they recognize it. And they know they're not the chosen one or they are the chosen one, they know. So this can't wait until your child is ready to date. This is a conversation that has to start in kindergarten and move up with them over and over. And it's not gonna be easy to dismantle this one because white people have a big stake in this. Um, they, really, they really have a big stake. Um, one of the things that I've been saying to white people recently, you know, they're all like, they're woke now. And they're all saying, well, what can I do? What can I do? And here's my message to white folks. If this stuff was happening to your child, you would figure out something to do. And you would not worry about if it was the right thing or the best thing, you would figure out something to do and you would go do that. So that's my challenge to you, white people, figure out something to do and go do it. And stop asking us, how can we help? How can we help? This is your problem. You created this system and you benefit by this system. You benefit by the fact that I will pay a higher price for, my, uh, for a mortgage, for a house, just because I'm black. You benefit, I live in the town of Milton. 
Nice, tawny suburb, right? Well, guess what? There are entire sections of Milton where real estate agents will not show a house to a black family, period. Today, today this is going on. So yeah, we got to call this shit out. And white people, you're on the hook. This is your system. You built it. You raised it up. You sustained it, maintained it. You didn't mind if there was Confederate flags all around. You didn't mind if the police beat us down every day. You really didn't care. So if you were really serious about being woke and wanting to help, figure out something to do and go do that thing. And don't come and ask me, is this thing all right? I really don't care. Just go do something. <laughs> yes, yes to everything you just said. It's, it's so important. And I think about just that aspect of just the importance of representation for all the shades, especially for those who are of darker complexion. We don't have enough of that. And it's so important to uplift um, all our brothers and sisters of darker complexion because they're not getting the uplifting that they deserve. So I think it's so important to do so, for sure. I saw somebody in the chat, I don't, I don't know who it was. Um, yeah, I was gonna bring up, uh, her name is Valerie Chambers. Um, mm -hmm. She had a question about what is the source of your courage? My ancestors. I told you my grandfather was born 10 years after emancipation. He was an orphan. He was picked up on a dusty road by a black couple in a buckboard wagon. He was starving, literally starving, and probably would not have lived another week if they hadn't picked him up. They adopted him, they took him in. They raised him, they educated him, provided him with the um, apprenticeship as a stonemason, which in that era was a, probably one of the highest of the craft positions for a black man that a black man could safely enter. He took him, used that as a platform, took himself back to school, got his uh, high school degree, went to college, got his bachelor's, went on to divinity school, got his master's of divinity, became a minister, raised six children. All six children went to college. I still marvel at his story, at his courage. What did he go through to accomplish what he did. I also often reflect on what was his children's experience because he had to have been gone most of the time to do all of that. So if we look at his children's experience, it must've been really difficult to have a father who was almost never home and a mother who was struggling at home with six kids and a mother who um, struggled with mental illness in an era when there was little or no treatment. I think about my father's father, who when he was 13 was put out of his home because his family was too poor to feed him. And the parents felt like they had to keep the babies because they couldn't survive. And he was old enough, they thought, to survive. 13, put out on the street, living rough, a man who run, ran a junkyard took him in and let him sleep in the junkyard. He also introduced him to alcohol. But that man grew up and he had a family and he produced my father. My father chose to be the husband and father that he became. and He worked hard at it. Certainly wasn't perfect, but he worked hard at it. And I have to say that as imperfect as a parent that he might have been, I never had a day in my life when I doubted that he loved us, period, ever. I might have been mad at him. I might have been throwing up my eyeballs and sucking my teeth, but I never had a moment of doubt that he loved us. I think about my grandmother. I found her picture and I never liked my grandmother but I found her picture online by accident one day when I looked up women in jazz, black women in jazz. I had no idea that she had attended Porro College in Texas, which was one of Madam C.J. Walker's colleges. And she played violin in the jazz orchestra. 
I was stunned, stunned. I knew she had had some college, but I knew nothing more than that because she wouldn't talk about it. Most of our elders will not talk because it's so painful what they went through. It's so hard. But for me, knowing that I came from these people who through everything survived and sometimes thrived, but they survived when the whole world wanted to kill them, literally kill them. And for me, if they could stand, I can't do less. I cannot do less. I must stand. And because I have access to more privilege than they had because of them, I must speak. I cannot stay silent. So yeah, I'm a mouthy one. I'm not shutting up. But that's where it comes from. Knowing my ancestors stood and did the best they could. And keeping in mind, we're only 50 years from freedom. Uh, we have another question in the chat from Alexis that says, how do you feel the experience of black families and their family related issues, such as mental health, might be compounded and or alleviated by them or by them, sorry, also by a military family? Well, I come from a military family, um, a proud military family. We are proudly army. Um, and for us, the military gave us a way to be in the world that was different than what was happening in the small towns of Black America of that era. Jim Crow was no damn joke. Jim Crow existed in the military too. I mean, I was probably about seven or eight when the military actually integrated. Um, but there was a sense in the military of some kind of order. People couldn't just run up on you and smack you around, but they could do that outside the gates of the army base. They could run up on you and smack you around. For a lot of families, the military life gives an opportunity to unplug yourself from a very dysfunctional community, um, like the community my father grew, grew up in. He grew up in St. Louis in the 30s. Not a pretty place to be for a black boy. And it allowed him to leave that. And most importantly, it allowed us to have a two-parent household with a father who was continuously employed. And that made all the difference because if he had left the military, he would not have been continuously employed. It might have damaged the marriage such that we would have ended up living with a single parent. So there are some benefits to military life. There are a lot of stressors as well, um, but for our family, it certainly provided a lifeline, a way out of the predictable outcomes of Jim Crow in the South. I think I do want to mention that it's different now because it's a voluntary army. And the thing I don't like at all is that we are redeploying our soldiers over and over and over and over, putting them in harm's way repeatedly, which did not used to happen when we had a draft and the military was bigger, that you would, you would go, you would be in a harm's way for a while, but then you would come out of that. And now we're just sending them back over and over. And I don't like that. I don't think that's right or just. Definitely. Um, we have a question from Judah. I hope I'm saying your name right. Um, uh, that asks, why do black families leave black community, uh, strive to get out? Most don't get back. They get education and good jobs, but abandon living in our community, quote unquote. Who wouldn't leave? <laughs> Segregation forced us into the worst housing, the worst property, the worst schools, the most violence. And we were forced to live there together, whether we had an education or not, we had no choice. Who wants to live there? Who wants to live on the street where gunfire breaks out every night? 
Nobody in their right mind. The people who live there don't want to live there. So, yeah, of course they want to leave. But I think that part of the problem is because we're judging them for leaving, we're not inviting them to come back and bring the resources that they can bring to help. And my experience is an awful lot of people who don't live in the community ghetto um, do help. You know, they're, they are big brothers and big sisters. They run Girl Scout, Boy Scout troops. They're involved with all kinds of things, but somehow we don't recognize that we're injured because they left. Yeah, they left, but we're, we need to make it easier. We need to invite them back in and we need to stop judging black families for moving out of the community. I mean, frankly, if I had to live with my son in a community where gunfire broke out every night and I knew that every time he walked out the door, he was subject to being recruited into a gang, I would leave. Why would I stay? Why would I keep my child in that environment? And that has nothing to do with how I feel about black people. That has everything to do with the lights just went out. <laughs> oh, they came back on. Magic. <laughs> I didn't know what was going on there. Did I say something? God, are you mad at me? <laughs> so I, th I think we have to be a little less judgmental of the families who do leave and make it easier for them to bring their skills, their talents, their love back and not keep judging them for leaving. I was lucky I got to raise my kid in JP, which at the time was pretty gang affiliated. I mean, it was not the place it is now. It's much more upscale now, but it certainly wasn't the worst of the worst. I would have moved heaven and earth to make sure that he could be as safe as I could make him. That's not a bad thing. Definitely. Um, it, we all want to be a part of a bigger community and uh, find ourselves in better predicaments than we initially come from. So I think you bring up very valid points. Um, and to not judge those who, uh, you know, decide to uh, better, better their situation than what they're already dealing with. So I think you bring up really great points. Um, so we'll be wrapping up now. Um, Thank you so much, Dr. Dow, for your words of wisdom and just being an overall fantastic person and blessing us with your presence. Um, do you have any final thoughts that you wanna share with us before we wrap up? I wanna say I am so impressed with young black people. They are standing on our shoulders and they have looked back and learned what they can learn, but they're doing it their way. I'm so impressed with our Black teens, the Black people your age. So I'm like in awe of y'all. Keep doing what you're doing. And don't keep trying to copy what we did. What we did was for a certain era, a certain time and place. What you're doing is for this era, this time and place. I'm so proud of young Black people. You, you guys are awesome. Awesome. Absolutely awesome. We're trying. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, that you try a dollop of courage. <laughs> exactly. Oh my goodness. What an amazing conversation this has been. Thank you all so much for joining us with the iconic Dr. Shawnee Dowd. If we can give her a round of applause. Thank you, Dr. Dowd. Thank you for having and, me. Oh, it's been a blessing. And I, if you can join me in also giving a round of applause to our amazing moderator, Tia Rivera. All right, Tia. Fabulous <laughs> job. Thank uh, you. And, and I also wanted to say thank you to the other Academy leaders, Brianna, Lanisha, and Lisa, who helped to plan and put this event together. Thank you so much for your brilliance. Thank you guys. So we hope that you, we, you join us again in the future for events that we host at the Center for Multicultural and Global Mental Health. And we hope that you have a great night. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shawnee. Thank you, Dr. Hey,